This is a message recorded at Kingdom City Conference 2018. Pastor Jedediah and his wife Amber have done amazing work at Missions Me that are now impacting and reaching the nations. He's also one of the most passionate communicators of our generation, and this message is sure to leave you inspired to change your world. If you'd like to see more content like this, do let us know by leaving a comment below. Share this video with your friends and subscribe if you'd like to see more videos like this. We're praying that this message will encourage you and leave you empowered to do amazing things. God, we give you permission. We just give you permission. We just give you, you're the point, you're the purpose, you're the plan, you're the first, you're the last, the beginning, the end, the alpha, the omega. God, you're everything. What a joy to know you, to be included in this company this army, this army for your mandate. Why don't we go to Matthew chapter 14. If you're wondering why I'm moving slow, I'm having my own experience with Jesus, so I'm just going to navigate that and hopefully maintain most of my bodily functions. That's weird. <laughs> Who says that? Matthew. Matthew chapter 14, verse 22. Matthew Chapter 14, for don't you guys love the Bible? Yeah. Hey, can I encourage you, especially if you're a young person in here, read your Bible. Yeah. It's like so basic, but we do have an, a, a biblically illiterate generation, which is why they're so confused on the topics of the day. The world's looking for answers, and we have a book that has them, yeah. and it would, it would help you to answer some of those problems if you read this book. More than a social media account, more than Facebook get there, just read this. It's inspired living. I, I've met people before that go, I've had people that have chased the prophetic word and I love hunger. They're like, I need a word from God. I go, I got a word from God. Read your Bible. <laughs> if you leave here and think you didn't get a word, you've missed something. And you can buy a passion Bible on the way out, Kingdom City, little merch plug just on behalf of the team. Matthew chapter 14, verse 22. You there? If it's not, if you're not there, it's on the screen, Matthew chapter 14, verse 22, going to be reading through verse 32. It says, immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and cross to the other side of the lake while he sent the people home. After sending them home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. Night fell while he was there alone. Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble. Look to your neighbor and say, in trouble. Look to your spouse and go, in, you're in trouble. They were in trouble far away from the land for a strong wind had risen and they were fighting heavy waves about three o'clock in the morning. It's early. Jesus came towards them walking on the water. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified in their fear. They cried out, Patrick Swayze, it's a ghost. But Jesus spoke to them at once, don't be afraid. He said, take courage, I am he. Then Peter called him, Lord, if it is really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. It's a crazy passage of scripture. I can't wait to watch it IMAX in heaven when we get there says, yes, come, Jesus said. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water towards Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified, and he began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith. If he had so little faith, what does no faith look like? Why did you doubt me? When they climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped. Then the disciples worshipped him. You really are the Son of God, they exclaimed. Can I pray for you as we get started this afternoon? Father God, we just thank you. God, this prayer for me is just a prayer of gratitude. We thank you for every person in the room. God, you see every season, situation, circumstance, every problem, position, and the pace of life. God, you see every need. And I thank you, God, for the last few days that we've been together, you've been meeting needs. You've been changing hearts. You've been reshifting and refocusing destiny. God, you've been doing what you do best loving us relentlessly. God, I pray, Lord, in these few moments we have today, Lord, that you would open our eyes and open our hearts and that we would never be the same. God, I pray, Lord, that you would speak beyond my words, that you would move into hearts, change our lives, move us closer to you, give us a deeper revelation of who you are, your son, and your love for us. God, it is an honor to stand here and be a part of what you're doing in this incredible movement you've named Kingdom City. All God's people said, uh, as I said earlier, I'm, I'm currently married, going to stay that way, really excited about it, to my first wife, as Dr. Maiden would say, I'm really loving my first wife, and um, I got uh, an incredible family, in fact, let's get a picture on the screen, if you got it, of 
Aww, look. I miss them. That's my wife, Amber, and uh, as I said, she's very hot and sexy. She's mine. I was tempted not to put the scripture, or the, the scripture, it's the Bible, it's the Bible for me. Um, put my family on the screen. I didn't want to cause temptation. You know, don't want, that's my miracle, get your own. That's why you're here. Bring your Bibles. And then I got these three, these three, uh, these three great kids. I got Anaya, she's seven, about to turn eight in December. She's brilliant, super intelligent. Um, I just love her. You know, every time I leave, I go, why is, why is dad leaving? Because it's really tough leaving the family. I go, why is dad leaving? You know why dad's got to go. And she looks at me before this trip. She says, because not everyone knows that Jesus loves them and you have to tell them. Yeah, she's exactly. Oh, she's just the best. And then I got Dalen, who's not Anaya. He's, he's uh, the four-year-old laughing. He's far from God. He's not saved yet. He is definitely, he needs your prayers. He has not had an encounter with Jesus yet. And then I have, this is the Christmas picture, so little Caden, he's now two. He just turned two um, last month, and he, did, he had the Holy Spirit for a while, and then his brother's a bad influence, so the dove's left. <laughs> we're, we're, we're waiting for the dove to come back, but they're just amazing. And to be very honest and transparent with you, I, I have been traveling a lot, and I'm not the type of uh, communicator or minister that wants to leave family. I'm looking for every reason to stay home. I'm trying to retire. It's not God's will, but trying to just retire and stay with home, and I'm trying to manage, to be honest, I'm trying to manage doing ministry and life. Any parents in here understand what I'm talking about? Like, you're trying to fulfill everything God's called you to do, and I'm trying to be a better husband while I'm, I'm working at it, and uh, me and my wife recently read the, the Five Love Languages book. Anyone read that Gary Chapman book, Five Love Languages? If you haven't, and you want to be married or stay married, I encourage you to read that book. The premise of the book is this, that you have a way you want to be loved, and that's not necessarily how your significant other wants to be loved. A guy's love language is super simple. It's like, you know, quality touch, acts of touching, physical touch. Like, that's guys like, right? Every guy's like, hey, amen, that's your moment. But girls are different. And, and the premise of the book is that we often love others how we want to be loved, but not realizing that's not their love language. And so as we, we studied this book, I learned something that was detrimental to our marriage and family, and it also sucks, is that all of my family, every one of them, their love language is quality time. Right? I'm not there right now. So it's like, everything's about quality time. It's about, I, I constantly have to do this quality time thing. And it's, it's the worst of all love languages. Anyone married to someone with quality time? Right? Like, it's the worst. Unless you don't have a job. Then you're like, the best love language would be gifts. Right? Like, that's the, unless you're broke. Then it's like really bad. But I wish it was gifts. I'd be like, just buy stuff for yourself. I love you. But no, I have to be in the room. Very challenging for the life that I live right now. And as I started realizing, my family created a sixth love language. Yeah, as they would. Why'd you go, ah? Oh. I was like, ah, oh. get it. No, a six. It's pain for me. It's not just quality time. It used to be I just had to be in the room. I just had to be present. I just had to be home. I just had to be there. But now their love language has advanced. It's a sixth love language. I'm helping Gary revise his book. And this sixth love language is quality attention. It's awful. I can't just be home. I have to be looking at every single one of them all the time. So when I come home, this is what my life looks like. When I come, I'll be preaching in Perth, and we'll, we'll go home on Sunday. I'll get there Monday. When I walk into the door, it's, all I hear is this, dad, 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 dad. And then my wife's in the background, babe, 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 dad, babe, babe, dad, dad. And I'm doing this. Yes, I'm, I'm looking at you and I. Yeah, yeah Dale, I'm looking at you. This is nonstop. That's why I look like this. I'm so much younger than you think, but my eyes have aged. I haven't blinked in five years. It's exhausting. It's just nonstop. You know what I'm talking about, right? It's like this constant, like, so I'm, I'm recently at a, at a football game. My daughter's playing football. I called it the right name for you guys here. In America, it's soccer, but we know Americans don't know what they're talking about. It's football. And I'm at her, it's a seven-year-old participation sport. Everyone's getting trophies, right? It's a joke. It's like, no, that's not how it works in life. This is going to set you up for, for a heartbreak that Dr. Maiden is going to have to heal you of later. Like, it's not, have to bring her to the next year's conference because it doesn't work like that. Now, of course, I kept score. That's me. You know, I was like, so they were like, yeah, we're not keeping scores. The ref's like, yeah, we don't keep score. I've kept score. We've won every game, and we're actually the real champions. So when I gave my daughter a trophy, I go, by the way, you really deserve this. You won every game. So I'm at one of her games, and I'm obviously just watching her the whole time, like nonstop and trying to put my phone down. The moment I pick my phone up, it's vibrating nonstop, I pick it up and I look, she scores a goal. 
I missed it. My wife elbows me, I'm on the phone, and I look up, she's already scored, people are cheering, and she's looking right at me, the death stare. <laughs> then she does this, she's intelligent, she looks at me and goes like this. <laughs> and then the coach looks at me and he goes, yeah, you. He's like, yeah, you bad dad who's never at this game. Pay attention to your, this is non, it's this nonstop journey. And I was recently at the airport, and um, which is like every week I'm at the airport, and I heard this familiar sound, death, death, death. And I thought Dalen got in a taxi, and he would, or an Uber in America, he'd Uber there. He's like, death, 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 death. And I look all the way down the row, and there's a guy checking in, another bad dad, not paying attention to his kid. And the kid's just going, death, death, death. Dad, 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 right behind him, and then I go, dad, for humanity's sake, be a present father, look at your son. It's a true story. And in that moment, I literally hear God speak to me, and he goes, this is a picture of me and humanity. And, I, and, and I'm like talking to him while I'm checking in, Delta Asian, and I was like, oh, I get it, God, it's amazing, you're Abba, your father, we can cry out to you, dad, dad, dad. And he goes, no, Jedediah, for what I want to teach you, I'm not the father in this story, I'm in this picture, I'm the son. He goes, you don't get it, I'm constantly trying to get your attention. I'm constantly trying to get you to look at me, I'm constantly, he, and, then he, and then he responds, you don't understand, you've always had all of my attention. You've all, from the moment, you got to think, from the moment he started this little thing called the planet and he put meaning into movement through creation, the moment he created us, that he has been fascinated, captivated, infatuated, constantly fixated and focused on us. Do you know right now the Bible says that all the, the great witnesses of heaven, the legends of the faith that we're reading today are standing on the edge of the clouds watching us? That we have a God that from the moment you started breathing and talking and walking, he's never stopped looking at you. He's never stopped paying attention to you. He's never removed his affection from you. He's never changed his focus from you. Right now, God's looking at us. I, I love the, the passage of scripture in Psalms that, that Pastor Mark actually opened this conference with. And I want to go back to it because I think it's so significant because the author, David, who's penning this great passage of scripture, is, is walking through a revelation of a God who's fascinated and fixated on him. And as I read this first, I'm not going to apologize for the long passage of scripture because I'm going to help fulfill your monthly Bible reading anyways, and it's the scripture. We're not going to apologize for it, but I want us, as I read it, for you to not think this as someone else who wrote it, but this is actually a revelation of how God sees you and has watched you. Psalms 139 says this, oh Lord, have you examined my heart? You know everything about me. You know when I sit down or I stand up. You know my thoughts, even when I'm far away, you see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I'm going to say even before I say it, Lord, you go before me and follow me. I love that verse. Do you know you have a God who's in front of you and behind you? He's actually made a way for you and then he's protecting you as you move through in your destiny. He's in front and behind. You place your hand of blessing on my head. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's too great for me to understand. I can never escape your spirit. Friend, you can never escape God's spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. If I ride on the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest oceans, even there, out here in Malaysia, your hand will guide me. Your strength will support me. I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night, but even in the darkness, I cannot hide from you. Why? Because to you, the night shines as bright as the day. Darkness and light are the same to you. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and you knit me together in my mother's womb. God formed you and fastened you. He, he was the one that created you. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous, how well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion and as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. Can I tell you something? Even before your parents knew you, God knew you. Some of you were like un unexpected. Some of you were unplanned. God was the one who planned you. Can I tell you something? If you're here today and maybe you were adopted or, or maybe you didn't know your parents and, and maybe you weren't wanted, maybe he says those words, listen, you, you did not come from your parents. You came through your parents. You came from God. You were God's idea. Here's the good news. I, my, my little sister, who's now 25, she was adopted. And I tell her, here's the reality. Your mom want, not have wanted you, but God wanted you so bad, he didn't care if the vessel cared. 
God wanted you on the earth so bad, he would use an unwilling vessel to bring you into the planet. You were God's idea, not your parents' idea. And you didn't come from your parents. You simply came through your parents. You're a son and a child of God. Get me excited. I got to wait. We got to save our energy for the rev. He says, every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. What's the point? He knows you. He knows the follicles that are on your head right now or the lack thereof. He knows how many steps you're going to take today. God was the original Fitbit. He knew your heartbeat. He knows your count. He knows how many breasts you have in your future and how many breasts you have in your path. God knows you. God is fascinated and captivated, infatuated by every single person. I'm not talking about the great Christians, the ones that are surrendered. He knows you and loves you just as you are right now. You do not have to leave this conference questioning if God has your attention. The question is, is does he ever have all of yours? We know, biblically, that all of God's attention is on you, but it's all of your attention on him. And when you think about God getting our attention, isn't that kind of where life begins to matter? Like when God finally grabs your attention, isn't that when your life moves from the mundane to the miraculous? Isn't this when your life moves from living a life of survival to a life of significance? Isn't when God gets your attention is the moment you stop wondering and wandering and you start taking steps full of purpose and steps full of passion and steps full of promise. It's this moment when God finally grabs our attention that our life begins to make a difference. And in essence, wouldn't this be our salvation story? Think about it. When you got saved, what happened? God got your attention. Whether it's at a connect group, whether it's at KLA, whether it's at a conference like this or earlier in this week, whether it's when you're at a kid's camp when you were a kid or opening the Bible and having a revelation that you never had before and simply saying, yes, it was the moment that God got your attention. It was the moment when you finally got a glimpse of that painful cross stained with his perfect blood. It's when you finally got a slight revelation of this scandal we call grace and this love we call reckless. It was the moment you finally turned your attention off of your sin and onto your Savior, off of the world and onto onto your worth, off of your past, and onto his plan. This is when our life, this is our journey with Jesus. This is how your story started, and this is how the disciples' story started. God got their attention. Think about it. He shows up on the scene. He's like, hey, hey. It's like doing that with a mic. Sounds great. Hey, come, follow me. What did they do? They, they suddenly got the attention. They, they realized Jesus was calling them. And what did they do? The natural response when, you, when God finally gets your attention is to leave everything. They walked away from their nets. They walked away from their worlds. They forsook their friends and their family. And they, they started this journey of a lifetime. And, they, and this is the key. They, they turned away from and turned towards. See, the challenge for a lot of believers is we've turned from but not towards. This is the difference between repenting and believing. Which is why Mark 1, I love the biblical context for this. He says, the time has come. Jesus speaking, the kingdom of God has come near. What does he say? Repent and believe the good news. You need to know there's a difference between believing and repenting. See, we have a generation right now that's made decisions but never had conversions. Which is wondered why we have the church we have that's sometimes not what it should be. It's because there are people that have said, I'm turning away from, I believe he died, so I'm going I'm to turn away from. But they get stuck in the middle and they never turn towards. Yeah. Friend, if you turn from but don't turn forward or towards, guess what? That's the difference. If you turn from, you're just a, a rescued victim. But when you turn towards, you realize you're a redeemed victor. See, God didn't just save you from something. He saved you for something. You weren't just saved by grace. You were saved for good works. You weren't just saved from death. You were saved for life. You're not just living for eternity. You're actually living from eternity. There has to be the turning towards Jesus and then the proceeding to follow him. This is basic discipleship. I remember I grew up in a home and my wife was like, my, my, my wife, that would be weird. It was, I was young. It was my mom. And... She'd always say, Jedediah, are you a disciple of Christ? I mean, you imagine growing up as a kid, 12 years old, you're a disciple? What does that mean? I don't even like the word. It's too close to discipline. Like, it's not my, no, I'm not, I don't know what that means. You know what, can I make it super simple? If you want to be a disciple, just take the next step towards Jesus. Look at the disciples. They didn't have it all figured out. They're denying him. They're, 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 they're betraying him. They're, they're getting rebuked by him. But you know what they just kept doing? Following. 
There's a crowd, right? And he says, hey, get in the boat. And guess what happened? The disciples are the ones who just continue to follow Jesus. They just continue to take the next step. In fact, when you look at the disciples, you know what their methodology was? Just follow him. They had no idea what was going to happen that day. They had no idea what it was going to look like. They didn't know. There wasn't like a plan. We got this miracle at 1 o'clock. And then Lazarus is coming at 3.30. We got to make that appointment. No, they simply just said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to take the next step. I'm going to find where Jesus is, and I'm going to follow. I'm going to take the next step of faith, next step of obedience, next step of, of loving, next step of... I'm just going to continue to take the next step towards Jesus. This is our journey. We have to have not just a decision. We have to have a conversion. That's what repent means. It means to turn away from and turn towards. Friend, many of you in here believe, but have you repented? And when we pick up in this story with Jesus, I, I love this story because the Bible says Jesus said, get in the boat. Go to the other, you know, you know the story. So Jesus said, get in the boat. So they're, they're in this boat and they're in a storm. So wait a second, they're in the storm because they're following Jesus. How many times do we see people in a storm and we think it's because they're out of God's will? Oh, is family sick? Must be sinning. Financial difficulty? They don't have faith. It's one thing to be the creator of your storm. It's the other thing to be led into a storm by the creator. Which means they're in, the, hear this. Can I just tell you something? For those of you in a storm, you don't have to raise your hand, but if you're in a storm, just because you're in a storm doesn't mean you're not in God's will. They're in a storm because they're following Jesus. Just because you're in a storm does not mean you're not in God's will. Just because you're in a prison doesn't mean you're not in God's promise. Just because you're in a pit doesn't mean you missed out on God's plan. Just because you're in a den doesn't mean that moment's not divine. Just because you can feel the fire doesn't mean you've lost God's favor. And just because it's difficult does not mean it's not destiny. Just because you're in a storm, come on somebody, does not mean you're not in God's will. They're in a storm following Jesus. And Jesus shows up and he's doing this little walking on the water trick he's been working on. It's pretty epic. And there's a few components of this story that relate to our life. There's a few basic elements that exist in our life. There's a, a boat. That boat represents the vehicle you're moving your life forward. They're in a boat and we got the disciples with us. That's the people you're doing life with. So right now, some of you have a job. Some of you have an idea. Some of you have a relationship. Some of you have an investment strategy. That's the vehicle you're using to move your life forward. Then there's the disciples, the people you're doing life with. Then there's the storm, season you're in, the circumstance, the situation, the problems that you're facing, adversity, opposition, whatever that looks like for you. And then there's Jesus. Here's the good news. Jesus is always there. Isn't that, we have a God that's not just on our side, but biblically, he's by our side. That's why when God sent his son into the world, he said, I will call him Emmanuel, God with you. Not just God for you, but God physically with you forever. They're in a storm. They're in a boat. They have this vehicle. They're moving their life forward. They have a group of friends they're, they're doing it with. They have a destination where God's called them to. And, and then there's Jesus with them. Now, there's a different story about six chapters earlier in Matthew 8 where the same components exist. There's a boat, right? There's a reference point for where we're going. There's a boat, right? There's the disciples, there's a storm, and there's Jesus. Except in that story, Jesus was in their boat. But in this story, Jesus isn't in the boat. Which is why Peter says, because he's just made his life so simple, where you are, I will be. I've repented. I'm turning and following you. So the only reason why Peter's getting out of the boat is because he's just following the methodology of life that he established when he encountered Christ. I'm going to follow Jesus. So if you're in the boat, I'm in the boat. That's why he didn't ask six chapters earlier in Matthew 8, Jesus, hey, let's get out of the boat together and walk on the water. Why would he do that? Jesus wasn't there. Which also means, friend, if you get there before God does, it does not make you early. It makes you wrong. So he's sitting there saying, hey, you're not in the boat. I got to get out of the boat. Not because of the water. Because he had this revelation, which I love. He, as he gets out of the boat, he's just so convinced to get to Jesus that it doesn't matter what he's walking on. And it does not matter what he's walking in. All that matters is who he's walking towards going to get this warmed up here. As Christians, 
It does not matter. This is going to help somebody. Take this home, write it down, get a tattoo on your back. It does not matter what we are walking on. It does not matter what we are walking in. All that matters is who we are walking towards. Someday you're walking on a firm foundation. Some days you're walking on water. Some days you're walking on a storm. Some days you're walking in a pit. Can I tell you, some days as Christians look like triumph and some days look like tri trials. Some days look like victory and some days look like defeat. Some days we're at a wedding celebrating. The next day we're at a funeral morning. It does not matter. Some days you're walking in and shaking the hand of the king. The next day you're carrying the backpack of a kid. It does not matter as believers. Can I tell you something Kingdom City as you move forward it does not matter what you walk on or what you walk in. All that matters is who you are walking towards. If Jesus is in front of you just keep walking. If you can see him just keep believing. If you can taste him just keep stepping. It does not matter. What we walk in, what we walk on, it's just who we are walking towards. Sometimes I'm so shocked at the rooms I find myself in, but Jesus was in that room, so it didn't matter how I got there or what brought me in. I could be the cleaner or I could be the leader, but if Jesus is in front of me, I'm moving, moving forward. Give him a shout of praise if you believe it. The question you have to ask yourself, is Jesus still in your boat? Is he still in that vehicle you're using to move your life forward? Is Jesus still in, I mean, he might have been six chapters ago. But right now, this new season, this new era, is he still in that job? Is he still in that conversation? Is he still in that habit? Is he still in that hobby? Is he still in that attitude? Is he still in that relationship? Is he still in that dream? Because he might have been, but I've learned something about Jesus. He moves. He don't stay in the same place. Is he still in that worship set? Is he still in your giving activity? Is he still in the faith that you started with? Is Jesus, because if Jesus isn't there, it's time to get out of that job, get out of that relationship, get out of that conversation, get out of that space, get out of that room. Just get to where Jesus is. Is Jesus, Jesus still, is he still in your boat that you're using to move life forward? There's nothing wrong with your boat unless he's not in it. And you gotta get out. Some of you are being called to go to some of these other campuses. I can just feel it. Some of you are called to start these other campuses, but you're so comfortable and you're, and you're building a case with yourself. But, but God told us, he, yeah, he did tell you to get in that boat and he was in that boat, but now he's telling you something else. And you gotta get out of that boat because when the boat has Jesus in it, it's called, but when he doesn't have Jesus in it, it's comfort. Comfort will put your call to death because your comfort zone's your coffin. It's going to kill you and the Christ inside of you. So, so, so he, gets out of the, he gets out of the boat. I love this. He just, the reason why I wanted to preach this message is because what your pastors have done for 12 years has got you out of the boat. But I, we're not here to get you out of the boat. I'm here to keep you on the water. See, he, he gets out of the boat. It's a beautiful story. And, and then we all know it. He, he begins to sink. He begins to fall. He, he, he begins to drown. A lot of people would say, scholars, people that have preached the scripture, they go, it's going to be because of fear. He was terrified. It was, right? It was because of fear that he began to, to sink. And you got to understand, there was fear before he got out of the boat. Right? And people are like, oh, I know it's faith when I have no fear. Faith is not the absence of fear. Faith is the great awareness of fear and then choosing to deem it irrelevant. Trust me, there's some things we're moving to where I'm like, oh my goodness. And then I go, but that's not, even, that's not relevant in my life. That has no place in my life. That has no stronghold in my life. Great, I'm aware there's risk, but there's no risk in faith following Jesus. He had fear. Before, it's, the Bible says they're terrified. It's a ghost. He was afraid, and guess what? He was aware of the waves and the wind. People were like, no, it was because he just looked at the waves and the wind. He did, but he looked at the waves and the wind before he got out. He was aware of the world he was in when he took a step of faith. There was a storm. It was raging. The water was not cool. The wind was howling, and he literally got out of the boat. What happened then? Why did he begin to sink? I believe that Peter sank not because of the presence of fear, but because of the absence of focus. See, faith, hear me, church. Faith gets you out of the boat, but focus keeps you on the water. So 12 years, you've been getting out of the boat. 
the challenge is not going to be your faith. These next 12 years, the challenge is going to be your focus. Because focus keeps you on the water. And then when you journey enough, you're going to realize there's no boat anyways. Like for your leaders, they don't got a boat to go back to. They're just telling everybody, come out here. 3,000 more campuses. I mean, it's 30 million people. I mean, it's crazy, right? Some, it's not 30 million. Don't worry, it's a million. That was a trick to make you, oh, a million? That's not as big as I thought because it's not 30, right? So, So here's the, here's the truth. The enemy of your faith is the enemy of your focus. See, so what I've realized, I've tried to, I do feel there's a grace on us for faith. And I always try to say, how do I get faith? How do I impart faith? How do I make, how do I make them have faith? And what I realize, I'm not trying to give them faith. I'm trying to help give them focus. I'm trying to, if you could, because if you could see Jesus, right, you might be dealing with a, a sickness in your body, but if you can see Jesus, you realize he's the divine healer. Everything's going to take care of itself. You might be in a position of lack or a position of poverty, but if you can see Jesus, if you can focus on him no matter what you see, you realize that I've been blessed with every spiritual blessing. You might be in a situation where you don't feel intelligent enough or don't have the capacity, but if I can see Jesus, I've realized that he's giving me the mind of Christ, which means he gives me his spirit so I can know his thoughts and I can know his ways. If you can just stay focused on Jesus, doesn't matter what's happened here, I just need to keep my my focus so the enemy doesn't need to destroy your faith he just needs to distract dilute and detour your focus people don't remember you see people like go off in the distance we go oh, we don't say they lost their faith we say they lost their way because they've lost their, you're not gonna leave here and lose your faith you're not gonna be oh, I just lost my faith no what happened you just slowly lost your focus faith is taking you to heaven but focus is bringing heaven to earth so the enemy quickly, and let's get the keys up just to make this feel a little more special. I just want to talk quickly for the time that we have, if this is helping anyone in the room, about the, just the three, I'm just going to point out three, three ways the enemy wants to detour, distract, and dilute your focus. You with me today? Yeah. Excited today? Yeah. Number one, the number one way, number one, the number one way, not in any particular order, the enemy wants to distract your focus. It's to get you to focus on the small things. He wants you to focus on the small things. Look at Matthew 6, 27, verse 33. Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. I want you to get this because it's going to switch quick. They don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for the wildflowers that are here today and thrown in the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Look at the words. Why do you have so little faith? What is the author talking about? Focus. Why you focus on that? Why you focus on that? Why you focus on that? Why do you have so little faith? Because your focus is directly connected to your faith. He says, so don't worry about these things. What will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? How many Twitter followers do I have? How much money do I have in a bank account? What does my retirement fund look like? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. So seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and He will give you what? No, really? Every, every, no. I mean, take this verse home. He's going to give you. It's crazy. I love this, Jesus. I love it in the NIV. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you. Friend, what are you seeking? Are you seeking a title? Are you seeking a position? Are you seeking a platform? Are you seeking a relationship? Are you seeking acceptance? Are you seeking affirmation? Are you seeking wealth? Are you seeking fame? What are you seeking? Because I've seen people seek those things before the kingdom and they get that thing but lose the kingdom. I've seen people seek a relationship, get their boo, their bay, and they lost God. I've seen people seek a position and they get that title, they get that income, they get that bank account, and they've lost the kingdom. But what is, I've never seen anyone seek the kingdom of God first and then lose their job, and then lose their home, and then lose their finances, and then lose their relationship. No, the reality is, is seek Him first. Let's make it super practical and you're not going to like me after this. When you woke up this morning, what was the first thing? What'd you go to? This hurts, I'm sorry. What'd you, what'd you do? You woke up first, what's the first thing you did? You grab your phone, you scroll through Instagram, you go to Facebook, you go to your bank account, you go to your fantasy football league for the few Americans that are here. What are the, what's the first, you go to the news, what's the first thing? Isn't it crazy how rough our days are because we don't start with God? 
I'll tell you, you want to change your life? Just give a 30-day commitment to say, Jedediah, every day when I wake up, the first thing I'll do is seek the Bible. The first thing I'll do is seek his word. The first thing I'll do is seek prayer, is seek his presence. It will change your life. I remember uh, Pastor John Cam, an incredible leader in New Zealand. He looked at me and he said, I start my day with God and I end my day with God. And I realized that I was ending my day, honestly, social media scroll, and then I'd go to the news. I would sit there for 15 minutes, read the news, go to sleep looking at terror, looking at death, looking at loss, looking at corruption, looking at wars, rumors of, that's what I would, God, can, we, we can't afford. We're about to spend all day in the world. We better start in the word, spend time with God, seek him first. Number two, he wants to distract our focus by getting to focus on the small things, the little things. Secondly, he wants to dilute our focus by getting us to focus on too many things. Because if the devil can't make you bad, he'll make you busy. That is the problem with our generation. Options. Like back in the day when this whole thing started, it was like serve Jesus and die, right? It's like, this is what you gotta do. And like, that's it. But now we have so many options. I love when in Matthew 22, one of the teachers, uh, one of the, the, the leaders of the day comes up to Jesus. He asks these questions. I need to understand before I read this verse that the Old Testament didn't just have 10 commandments, it had 613 commandments. A lot of problems with 600, I can't even remember six things, let alone 613 things. Matthew 22, teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And secondly, it's equally important to this, love your neighbor as yourself. Can I tell you something, friend? When Jesus becomes the lens of your life, life becomes simple. If you're sitting here saying, Jedediah, what am I supposed to do? How do I find my purpose? How do I find my promise? How do I find my destiny? Very simple. Ask yourself one question. What does loving God and loving others require of me today? Jesus reduced this whole thing, all the commandments, all the laws, all the prophets, all the prophecies. He made it extremely simple, knowing that we would have a world full of options that could keep us busy and keep us focused on the world and not focused on God. He said it's super simple. You want to know what to do today? Love God, love others. You want to change the world? Take two steps every day, Kingdom City. One towards God, one towards others. What am I going to do this week? I'm going to take a step towards God. I'm going to take a step towards others. How do I find my destiny? Love God, love others. How do I find my purpose? Love God, love others. How am I going to make a difference? Love God, love others. What should I do tomorrow? Love God, love others. Ask yourself, I'm telling you, change your world. Ask yourself every day, what does loving God and loving others require of me right now? How are you going to multiply to a million people? Because thousands of people made a commitment daily to take two steps and simplify their life and focus to simply loving God. God and loving others. We well, don't know what I'm going through, but right now, what does loving God and loving others require of you right now? Love God, love others. Love God, love others. Don't make this thing complicated. Our gospel is so simple. Love God, love others. He comes back. That's it. Number three, helping anybody? Sorry, I'm getting a little passionate. He wants us to focus on the small things. He wants us to focus on too many things. Number three, wants us to focus on the old things because sometimes the enemy of our next step is our last step but I want you to hear me for you it doesn't mean it was a misstep for many of you in your mind it was your best your best step you know what the enemy of your future is thinking the glory days are behind you Some of you are being like, oh, the glory days. Remember when I had long hair. Jesus was coming back. We were living in communes. Sorry, those were hippies in America. Remember that move of God three years ago at Kingdom City? Remember what some people have said. Remember what it's like when we were small. How intimate it was. It was just a few of us. That was the best. The enemy of everyone's future in this room is thinking the best is behind you. Because you know, the Bible says that God takes us from glory to average. Right? Glory to okay. Glory to mediocre. Glory to surviving. He takes us from glory to man, this really sucks. From glory to man, my back really hurts. The Bible says 
What's the future of Kingdom City? Where are you heading? He's going to take us from glory to glory to glory to glory to bigger to more to new. Come on, from glory. Where are we going? From one campus to six campus to 10 campuses to 20 campuses to 100. Where are we going? From five people, 50 people, 5,000 people, 50,000. Because we have a God that every day is a better day because he takes us from glory. Come on, to glory. Your best days or your next day. Can you feel that? Your best days. And you may be saying, well, do we not tell the testimony? Trust me, I've, I've preached this before. I've had some feedback. Why can't we talk about what God did before? You need to understand, anyone who's talking about the old days, when you're sharing the testimony, the testimony of Jesus carries the spirit of prophecy, which means if you talk about what God did, you're creating an invitation for what he's about to do. So you can talk about the old days as if glory days, only if they're going to introduce new days that are better days. Let's talk about what he did in the 70s. Let's talk about the revival of the 90s. Let's go all the way back to what he did in the 1900s with Amy Simple McFree. Let's, let's look at it, and then let's go, wait, wait a second. He couldn't have put the best in the past when he always saves the best wine for last. Come on, just shout for a second. It's only gonna get better. Gotta end quickly. Philippians 3, it's like one of my favorite verses. We're about to end, get ready. It says, I'm not saying I have this all together, that I've made it, Philippians 3, verse 12, but I'm well on my way, reaching out for Christ who so wondrously reached out for me. Friends, don't get me wrong, by no means. Do I call myself an expert? We're never gonna be experts. We're all on this never-ending journey of not arriving. But I've got my eye on the goal where God is beckoning us onward to Jesus. I'm off running, I'm not turning back. Look at verse 13, NLT. But I focus on this one thing. You know what he focused on, Paul, the author? Forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. So let's keep focused, this is my commission to you. Let's keep focused on that goal. Those of us who want everything God has for us. If any of you have something else in mind, hear these words. Something less than total commitment, God will clear your blurred vision. There's only one posture of a Christian, it's surrender. It's full commitment. Anything else is a lack of focus. Anything else is what? Blurry vision. Don't judge me, this is the Bible. You'll see it yet. Now that we're on the right track, let's stay on it. Stick with me, friends. Keep track of those running the same course, headed for the same goal. Please get in a connect group and find people going the same direction. It's gonna be so much easier to run with people running the same way than trying to run back when the world's pulling you a different direction. He said, keep track of those running the same course, headed for the same goal. There are many taking other paths, choosing other goals, and trying to get you to go along with them. I've warned you of them many times. Sadly, I'm having to do it again. All they want is the easy street. What's the world want? The easy street. They hate Christ's cross, but easy street is a dead end street. Those who live there make their bellies their God, belches are their praise, and all they can think about is their appetites. But there is far more to life than this because we, me, you, us are citizens, citizens, citizens of high heaven. It's far more to life for Kingdom City. Because we're citizens of high heaven. So tonight, what are you saying? It's time to shift our focus. You're never gonna lose your faith, but you'll lose your focus. Some of you in this room have lost your focus. And I feel God calling us again. He's going, hey, son, 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 daughter, 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 hey. Shift your focus. Come on, it's time for us to shift our focus off of what we can make to making a difference. Shift our focus off of what we can gain to what we can give. Shift our focus off of us onto others to shift our focus off of making a living to making a difference, shift our focus off of earthly existence to eternal significance. Come on, it's time for us to shift our focus from our sin onto our salvation. 
from our past onto his plan. It's time for us to shift our focus from what we've been walking on and what we've been walking in to who we are walking towards. Come on, it's time for us to shift our focus back onto our son, back onto our savior, back onto his will, back onto our God. It's time for us to shift our focus from keeping up with the Joneses to keeping up with Jesus because we have a God that does not want our glance, but he deserves and he demands our gaze, undivided, full surrendered attention to Jesus. 